for inviting me to speak here today. Um, I'm going to shift the topic a little bit because I'm, I don't specifically talk about family violence. I talk about gender, cultural and historically how it's embedded into our society. Can I just quickly have a check? How many people in the room were at the talk I gave yesterday? Okay, fair few. Okay, because I'm going to change it slightly and you'll be delighted because it makes it slightly shorter. Yesterday I talked both about householder resilience and looked at structures within firefighting agencies that are gendered. Today I'll specifically focus on householder resilience and I will add some examples at the end that sort of dwells in more to the nitty-gritty details of it. So the reason why I've been invited to speak to you here today is because of my new book. Here's the proof. And I've got copies with me if anyone's interested in buying a copy. Um, to set the scene of my talk, I'm going to rewind the clock to Black Saturday because it's the events of that day that structure the opening of my book. It's not the story most of you are used to hearing about that day, though. Um, rather, it tells the story of an interview I did that day that became the catalyst for writing my book. So what I'll do is I'll start out by reading the opening of my book to you. Saturday, the 7th of February, was a sweltering hot day on the New South Wales Southern Tablelands. Even at 8 o'clock in the morning, as I drove through the farm gates to the property of the couple I was to interview, the weather felt oppressive. The air had already started to shimmer with heat. I remember wondering if I should have informed the local bushfire brigade that I was in the vicinity in case they needed an extra pair of hands over the weekend. I also felt relieved that I had only managed to line up one interview that day and the need for bushfire risk engagement initiatives specifically targeting women. It was a heartfelt conversation that laid bare honest feelings of frustration and fear towards bushfires. Five years later, the passionate voice of the woman is as vivid in my mind's ear as if the interview had taken place yesterday. Upon hearing that funding had not been secured to expand an innovative and successful trial of training courses specifically targeting women's bushfire preparedness in South Australia, Nicola, a public servant, had exclaimed, I'm not surprised. I'm not surprised. It probably occurred more directly, more immediately after the last batch of bushfires. The money dries up. The sympathy, emphasis and focus go to, oh no, we are running out of electricity, water and something other much more urgent. Whatever the newspaper headline is of the day, give me an immediate political response. We always call it the Daily Telegraph moment of truth. What's the driver behind this according to the Daily Telegraph? Is this a policy announcement in response to the Daily Telegraph? Are we amending a policy in response to the Daily Telegraph? Or how will this policy be read by the Daily Telegraph? Because that is Australia, public general. What we need is a couple of women and children burnt to death in the next bushfire. I am so sorry, but that is the tragic truth. We need the picture of the woman running down the road with kangaroos fleeing with her hair on fire for it to be that Daily Telegraph policy. Women abandoned. Unfortunately, it's an incredible driver of policy here because we have no poli commitment politically to the long term. Now, little did Nicola know that as she was telling this politically motivated tale, this worst case scenario was actually unfolding that very moment, 700 hundred odd kilometers to the southwest. We were blissfully unaware of this natural disaster as the property had no mobile or television reception. I returned to the bush cabin where I was staying to find the newspaper reporting a suspected death toll of 40 plus. By the end of the Black Saturday ordeal, the extent of the death and destruction had reached historical and tragic proportions. Australia was yet again licking its burn wounds. How, after so many years of bushfires and endemic force in Australian landscape, are we still so vulnerable to bushfires? I wondered in hindsight if we would have known or had time to react appropriately if a bushfire of similar scale, intensity and speed to those in Victoria had hit the New South Wales Southern Tablelands that Saturday in 2009. My reflections on the event that 
the events that unfolded that day and during subsequent bushfires in both Australia and the US point to a strong link between bushfire amenity migration and gendered vulnerability in and through place, namely, namely amenity-rich bushfire-prone landscapes at the edge of the city and beyond. So that's the opening of my book. And these are some of the um, study areas I've been working in over the last seven years. The reason why Nicholas, quote, became the catalyst for my book is because it opened my eyes to what had been all around me all along, and that is the gendered norms that are so embedded in our everyday lives that until that point I did not see them, or if I did see them, it was generally something I didn't quite know how to deal with. And that's a tendency I started to realise applies to many, if not most people. I did not choose gender as an axis of analysis, it chose me. Gendered dimensions of bushfire was everywhere in my data, in the narratives of householders, wildland firefighters and Aboriginal elders alike. What really surprised me about my work was women and men consistently upheld to me conventional views of bushfire management as men's business in their narratives of both living and working with fire. And this description um, of firefighting men as mythologised heroes by one interview participant is indicative of how the agency of bushfire over time has helped shape the cultural identity. So what she's saying is the mythical building up of the bushfire volunteer. It's very important that we always have that mythical icon. It has to be male. We cannot have our mean women back the scones and sell them to raise money. We must have that icon. Bushfire always gives us that. However, what became increasingly clear to me during the seven years of writing and studying for this book is how both women and men suffer from structural biases when it comes to household decision making, social constructions of gender and gendered aspects of agency that manage fires. Before I go any further, I want to make sure that we're all on the same page in terms of what I'm referring to when I talk about gender. If there's one thing I'd like to achieve with this talk, it is for everyone to recognise gender not in terms of gender differences, but in terms of gender relations. Gender is a matter of social relations, i.e. social structures with enduring or widespread patterns rather than an expression of dichotomous biology. And I've included a quote here by Raywin Connell, who's written extensively on this topic. And what Raywin says is, we cannot think of womanhood or manhood as fixed by nature, but neither should we think of them as simply imposed from outside by social norms or pressures from authorities. People construct themselves as masculine or feminine. We claim a place in the gender order or respond to the place we have been given by the way we conduct ourselves in everyday life. Now, with this definition of gender in mind, why is it important to consider gender in emergency management? Well, it matters for three reasons. One, the findings in my book clearly demonstrate that gender matters because gendered norms structure women and men's level of risk tolerance and actions in ways that negate the otherwise changing social circumstances in places where rural and urban lifestyles intermix. It matters because even when stated policy appears gender aware, institutions reproduce the prevailing values of society more often than they challenge them. And it's a fact that power dynamics in mixed settings are generally disadvantageous to women. Three, It matters because institutions are gendered with internal gender regimes that function in a wider context of gender relations, all of which produce gender effects. And again, I've got a quote here by Rewin Canal, and it's the latter half of the quote I want to focus on, where she says, without even being named as gender, a socially defined masculinity may be built into the very concept of management or organisational um, rationality. Yeah, so think about that in terms of emergency management. It might not even be named as gender. It's just so implicit and embedded. Now, given these three points, it is rather extraordinary that through the ebb and flow of public and agency debates over how to coexist with bushfire, 
The role of bushfire in moulding and upholding gender roles within Australian society has rarely been discussed. And the work from the past two conferences we just heard about is groundbreaking. It is not well covered anywhere in the world, not just in Australia. This is very new and groundbreaking. Um, the AFAC's position statement is one I'm going to bring up as well because that is a classic case in point. This is the position statement on bushfires and community safety that we're all supposed to refer to when it comes to advising our community on how to stay safe. But it doesn't mention gender at all in that position statement. One other de definition that I want to just clarify, and this is um, something that Naibab will talk more about as well, so I'm not going to go into a great amount of detail, but I want to just mention intersectionality because it's a concept that's widely used in the social sciences to emphasise that social characteristics such as gender cannot be understood in isolation of other social characteristics such as class, education, disability, age, race and sexuality. And I'm going to use this particular case study of household vulnerability and resilience to look at how social characteristics intersect in everyday life in ways that impact on coping capacity. So the first case, well, the case study um, is looking at the increasing diversity in types of householders and homes at the rural urban interface. And it's important to hone in on that point because in the context of gender and bushfire, um, home traditionally is a gendered domain, but also because home often is regarded by Australians as a place of safety during bushfires. It is increasingly recognised in scholarly research internationally that women and men are exposed to risk in different ways at different levels because of the everyday gender division of labour, the distribution of power and therefore decision-making processes, and that's domestically, locally and officially. They are also exposed differently because of the gendered norms that underpin intended and actual patterns of disaster preparedness and response. So while gendered dimensions of bushfire on the surface often appear to reinforce women's vulnerability more so than for men, the findings in my work clearly show that in an increase of both men and women because of the activities that they perform before, during and after bushfires. And poignant statistics that drive home this message of gendered vulnerability are those of current day plans of action, as well as the activities performed by women and men at time of death historically. So this data is from an Australian-wide online survey that we ran during the 2012-2013 uh, bushfire season. And it recorded a significant difference between the plans of, act, plans of action of women and men during bushfires. Almost three times the number of women planned to leave early compared with men who planned to leave early. And almost three times the number of men who planned to stay and defend um, than women who plan to stay and defend. And this is a consistent finding from across my research and research by either others in Australia, for example, um, May Proudly and Helen Goodman have done similar work. Now, work by Catherine Haynes and colleagues um, on trends in bushfire fatalities in Australia demonstrate the majority of fire-related deaths between 1900 and 2008 were amongst men, 67% to be exact, most of whom died outside while attempting to protect assets. While male fatalities have decreased during the second half of this period, from 77 to 57% of all deaths, there has been an increase in the number of women dying in bushfires since 1955, from 16% to 38% of all deaths, most of whom died while sheltering passively or evacuating. Now, what Catherine Haynes and colleagues highlight is that this gender division in fatality trends is likely to be related to changing social circumstances in impacting on activities at time of death. So more men worked outdoors in 1900 than today, and more widespread ownership of cars nowadays means that more people have the means to travel during times of danger. Nevertheless, John Hanmer and colleagues at RMIT University found that the gender distribution of fatalities during Black Saturday fires 
was generally similar to historic fires with 58% of the 173 fatalities being men and 42% women. When these current and historical trends are compared, a frightening correlation emerges between women and men's intended actions today and the gender split in, a, in actual activities at time of death historically. In short, most men intend to evacuate, sorry, most women intend to evacuate, women predominantly die while attempting to evacuate or sheltering passively. Most men intend to stay and defend and most men die outdoors attempting to defend assets. Now, there's some rather grim statistics. And these findings are but one of many examples in my book of, that point to some very hard-won lessons about the gender dimensions of bushfire in which many women deprioritize bushfire preparedness in the context of other pressing issues in everyday life, while societal pressure sees many men perform protective roles that many have neither the knowledge nor the ability to safely, to safely attempt to fulfill. The clearly information, engagement and education initiatives currently in place have not managed to curb this trajectory of bushfire fatalities. One of the, finding, of the other findings highlighted by John Hanmer and colleagues after Black Saturday um, was the role in household disagreement, and so what Daryl was talking about before, the role of household disagreement in dangerous last minute change of plans. And I want to pick up on this point um, because that data is also evident, that finding is also evident in our uh, data from the online survey last year, which showed a discrepancy between survey respondents' plan of action when compared with those of other household members' plan of action. And the biggest discrepancy indicated there by the um, orange arrow is to do um, with the plans of actions um, with regards to to staying and defending with 42% of respondents who plan to do so indicating that other household members um, do not intend to do so. They plan to mainly leave early or wait, to see, wait and see. And so what recent bushfires and the research after recent bushfires have showed us is that this can have potentially fatal consequences. These differences within households and the lack of preparedness in terms of having nutted out an agreement what that means when essentially um, the fire comes over the hill. A plan that has been discussed and agreed with all household members regardless of gender and age is also important due to the likelihood that not all members of the household being at home at the time of the fire. Of the people in the survey who had been directly impacted by bushfires in the past four years, um, and so that's between February 2009 and February 2013, 92% were women. And this could be a reflection of more women being home alone, often with children during the day. And I have an example here from some of my work where a female interview, interview participant was saying, well, the biggest fear is that he's out somewhere. There's no mobile range here. Once I phoned up to say there's a lot of smoke and I can smell burning, Where's it from? I was obviously by myself. I think I had one of the kids with me. Like, you've got to be able to talk to somebody. Like, what do I do? I can't even turn on the pumps. I have to have him telling me what to do. Well, my follow-up question to this was, well, why don't you learn how to run the pumps? And when you start to unpack what this particular woman women had to do on an everyday basis, it was not as simple as just learning how to connect the pump to the dam and making sure that it connected to the sprinklers and everything was okay. She was much more concerned about, on an everyday basis, covering her work, which was commuting some distance, getting the kids to school, making sure the kids behave, making sure the household ran, and making sure that if something potentially dangerous happened, that she could get out with the kids. But she didn't really have the time to think about how that would look, how would she get out, and what would her trigger point be? That was one of the big things for her because she found it really hard to get information. Those who had been directly impact, impacted by fires in the last four years in our survey, interestingly, were also more likely to have evacuated 
than those who had experienced bushfire prior to 2009. So prior to 2009, the number of people who had been impacted by bushfires that, would, that had evacuated were between 7 and 23%. After 2009, it was 64% of survey respondents who had been impacted that had evacuated. So it's a massive change there, and we can't tell exactly from the data why that is, but it's definitely noteworthy. It could be because of the serious scare that Black Saturday inflicted across the country, but it could also be because of the changes to official advice subsequently from the Prepare, Stay and Defend and Leave Early policy to the Prepare, Act, Survive policy. As I say, we can't tell for sure, but it's certainly something, a trend that's starting to emerge. I've put this slide in here, um, again from the same online survey, and this is breaking it up, looking explicitly at New South Wales, South Australia and Tasmania, because they were the ones we had the biggest samples from. And what it shows, which correlates with Jim McLennan's point from yesterday about not enough people have a written survival plan. However, I disagree with with Jim's point that are we flogging a dead horse in case in the in the case of promoting um, a written survival plan. I think what really this data shows is that what we need to put more emphasis into is explaining why it is it's important to write it down, discussing it and practicing it as a household, across gender, across age. Um, and I've got a couple of examples here of why it is a written plan. Actually, the act of sitting down and, and making the written plan. It's not the written plan as such that makes a difference. Um, it's the cognitive processes that happen when people sit down and discuss what they're going to do. And when people talk about their mental plans, there are some huge gaps in them that are very easily identifiable when you write, write them down. But when you're just talking about it, they just don't um, emerge the same way. And this is a good example of how when things do not go to plan, which we all know is often the case in bushfires, actually having discussed it thoroughly, written it down, and identifying roles within the household, this family were okay. So what they're talking about is that they send away their musical instruments um, because that's their livelihood. And I asked them, well, at what point did you send away your um, instruments? And the husband said, well, before, more or less. And the wife said, well, it was about half an hour before because I was driving back up the drive with spot fires raining down around her. And when you think back at the trauma and unpacking the trauma of the day, um, he's saying, was it really that late? And she's saying, yeah, they were landing up there where the power, pole, uh, power lines are. And then he then kicks into their preparedness plan. He's saying, well, see, the other thing was, because we had a plan, we didn't work together, we basically went and did things with other people because we knew what, we were, what was going on. So it didn't matter what happened. It didn't matter what curveball you would send to them at, send at them in a, at some odd angle, they would deal with it at their various positions around, around the property um, because they had a plan. This, a lot of text, but I'll talk you through it, um, not quite such a ha happy example. This lady um, who I interviewed last year just after the Tasmanian fires um, had relocated to Tasmania after the Black Saturday fires. And so she's saying, when she lived in Victoria, she said, no, no, never felt at risk. And then when the fires came, it was quite horrific. What I saw and what I knew was happening, I just felt like a real idiot. And she's feeling like an idiot because she didn't have a plan. And so within a week, I had developed a detailed fire plan. They, as in her family, thought I was a bit crazy. And so she goes on and talks about how she very pedantically put together a plan and all its different elements. And then she sort of pauses and she says, but they wouldn't sit. Well, my sons wouldn't sit down and look at the plan. And my husband, husband humoured me. People who haven't had the experience of being involved in an emergency don't understand the complexities of what can happen in an emergency. How your normal thinking process just goes out the window. 
That is why it's so important to have a plan, and she goes into it, writing it down and identifying roles and all of that. But she then says the worst thing, the worst thing wasn't actually Black Saturday on the fires that they've just been evacuated from in, in Tasmania. The worst thing was the lack of support that she got from her family about being prepared. And by this point, she's crying. She's visibly upset. And it's the disempowerment that the lack of support from her family is, is making her feel like she can't, A, be a carer for her family, but also, B, she's trying to, to change the trend in her community where women often are not preparing. She wants to be prepared, and she's not getting the support. If anything, she's being belittled by the male members of her family because all of her children were sons. Like, this is important. It's important that we change the language in terms of how we communicate with families to support each other about having a whole of family um, plan. So I think I'll leave it at that and open up for questions if anyone have any. Um, I think it's in the context of what we're talking about today. Sorry, I talk with my hands, which means the microphone gets battered. Um, is change happens with us, i.e. us as individuals, and that is whether it's fire prevention, preparedness, or violence prevention. It's the same as that motto that's been used for um, the new racism campaign is racism starts with me. Well, violence starts with me. Preparedness starts with me. Prevention starts with me. It's, it's one of those where we each have to step up and make a difference because we can make a difference, and that's the important thing to put across. It might feel completely overwhelming, but every tiny little baby step makes a difference, and that's the key message in all of this. Thank you.